Ronnie Flynn, thank you, Ronnie, for playing for us this morning and um, getting us off to a great start in our worship today. It was as beautiful to watch as it was to listen to. That's amazing skill. We appreciate that. And Happy New Year again to those who haven't seen you yet this year. Happy New Year. We begin the new year in earnest after the Christmas season. And in the church calendar year, you know, we have Advent, we have Christmas, we have Epiphany on January 6th, and then the first Sunday after Epiphany um, on the church calendar is usually called Ordinary Time. <laughs> and ever since COVID hit, I'm not sure there is such a thing as Ordinary Time anymore. Do you know what I mean? And maybe even starting before that, but here we are. And the first Sunday after Epiphany uh, is always a reflection on the baptism of Jesus. And so I'm going to return to that um, this morning because it's a wonderful reminder to us of our belovedness as Jesus learned about his belovedness at his baptism. So welcome this morning. One announcement I'll make is read the announcements. There you go in the bulletin. They're all there for you. Everything you need to know. So let's dive in to worship and to God's love this morning as we join in our call to worship. God's voice speaks into our chaos, creating life and order and peace, gathering us together to remember who we are and whose we are, and to find meaning and purpose. God's voice flows like living waters of grace. Our new name, beloved, resounding in our souls. 
God's voice stirs the waters of baptismal hope, calling us to be bearers of peace to a world that is hungry for hope. Let's stand and sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Good morning. Please join me in the prayer of praise. We praise you for creating this world in all beauty, for redeeming the world through Christ our Lord. And instruct and sustain us. We long for
Please join me in the prayer of confession and reflection. Loving God, we confess that we have allowed so many things to come between us and the good news of the gospel, that we cannot see the light of Christ or hear your voice calling to us. We are tempted to listen to false voices and follow false ways. Open our ears to listen to your voice and open our hearts to trust you and follow your ways that we may receive our true identity as your beloved children. Please take a few minutes for silent time and reflection. Please respond to the words of assurance in bold. We expect the fire of judgment, but are given the spirit of grace. We expect God to call us bad names, but we are given a new name and called beloved. We expect God to be angry, but the dove of peace descends upon us. This is the good news for us. Thanks be to God. Please stand and pass the peace in a way that is comfortable for you.
The first reading is from Acts, chapter 19, verses 1 through 7. 1 through 7. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, Then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. The word of God. As I mentioned uh, at the beginning, this is the traditional Sunday to reflect on Jesus' baptism following the birth of Christ. Uh, this is a great way to start the new year with the freshness of new birth and now the reminder through the baptism of Jesus of our belovedness as God's children. And it may seem abrupt to go from birth to adulthood, but the gospel writers don't fill in the childhood and young adulthood of Jesus except for one encounter in Luke's gospel of Jesus as a, uh, what I like to call a willful pre-adolescent. <laughs> in fact, Mark's gospel, which I'm reading from this morning, doesn't even include the birth story. In Mark's gospel, John the baptizer suddenly appears, then Jesus appears for baptism, and off we go. So here's Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as you just heard from Acts. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, The one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, my Beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week, Heidi and I watched a two-hour tribute to Barbara Walters. And um, as was told in that uh, tribute, she wasn't afraid to ask the tough questions, but she did it in a very, a very disarming way. But she always got straight to the point. In fact, some of the celebrities would say, well, you don't pull any punches, do you? But they always felt like they were treated as a human being, which is what we loved about Barbara Walters. Mark's gospel feels that way to me. You know, let's get right to it. Mark pulls no punches. <laughs> he wastes little time in connecting some dots for us. First, he connects Jesus, the Son of God, to the fulfillment of Old Testament longing. And then Mark connects Jesus with John the Baptist right away. John appears in the wilderness quite suddenly. John baptizes to repentance and the forgiveness of sins, and people came from all over the region, Mark tells us, hungry, it seems to confess and repent. And so Jesus comes and is baptized by John like everyone else. Ordinary Jesus. No conversation, no details, no fanfare. An ordinary event. 
But he, as he comes out of the water, the extraordinary happens. The Holy Spirit descends in the form of a dove, and a voice comes from heaven, and the voice says, You are my beloved. With you I am well pleased. This is who Jesus is, beloved Son with whom God the Father is well pleased. It was apparently important for him to hear and to know that. And it was important that a large crowd was there to hear and witness it. So why did Jesus need to hear this? Why was that important? Well, before I dive into that, I want us to first be surprised that Jesus got baptized at all. In the other Gospels, John the Baptist indicates that Jesus should be the one baptizing him and not the other way around. This is Jesus' first adult act in all of the Gospels. And this first deed, if you will, of Jesus, the first act of our Lord, is actually not to do anything, but to consent and to receive. This is very important. Jesus doesn't come into his adult life and ministry busy with activity, you know, with great fanfare, with mighty deeds, or with teaching. The first thing Jesus does is consent to baptism. He goes down in the water with us and for us. Jesus identifies with us, with our humanity, from start to finish, from birth to death. Jesus becomes completely one with us in our humanity and identifies with us in our humanity. And that is why he submitted to baptism. He didn't need it. In a way, we needed him to do it. And it was an act of sheer grace on our behalf. It was an act of love for Jesus to submit to baptism because it means that he's willing to go down with us and meet us in our humanness and identify with us in our humanity, messes and all. The good news of Jesus' baptism is that our frailty and our messiness and our humanity does not scare him off. And the symbolism of the dove resting on Jesus, or the, the, the Holy Spirit resting in the form of a dove, is part of the significance of this identifying with lowly humanity. It isn't fire or symbolic fire that descends on Jesus like at Pentecost. It was something that looked like a dove. Certainly the dove represents peace and that God is bringing salvation to humanity through Christ. Uh, remember Noah's Ark, right? And the dove came and brought the, the olive branch as a symbol of being saved from danger as the flood receded. But for those who witnessed Jesus' baptism, the dove also represented poverty. Remember, since we're right on the heels of Christmas, last week uh, the passage we looked at when Mary and Joseph dedicate Jesus in the temple Instead of paying the usual offering for this dedication, they had to avail themselves of a provision in the law that accommodated the poor, and they offered two doves. That would not have been lost on the witnesses of the baptism, and the Holy Spirit resting on him in the form of a dove shows that Jesus would identify with humanity in our lowliness and poverty, materially and spiritually. Blessed are the poor. Jesus would say later in Luke's gospel. This is why Jesus was baptized. Now, why these words from heaven? You are my son, my beloved. With you I am well pleased. I think this is the most significant part of the baptism, these words. They're spoken because it was important for Jesus to receive his identity, spoken out loud over him before he did anything. Yes, he is God's son come to us in human form, but as a human being, he needed to hear the words of identity and affirmation spoken over him by his heavenly father. And we need to hear those words as well and receive our identity from our heavenly father. It's so important that we know who we are. Do you know that God is pleased with you right here, right now? That you are God's beloved daughter, you are God's beloved son with whom he is well pleased, that God delights in you right here and right now. For years, decades, maybe even a few centuries, the message we received has been original sin. You know, you're a sinner. That's what we have been told is our identity, our baseline of, of standing before God. And I just want to ask, how's that worked for us? 
This is why in the Acts 19 passage, there is an important shift from the baptism of John, which was a baptism of repentance, to the baptism in the name of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, a baptism of belovedness, where we affirm, you are my daughter, you are my son, with you I am well pleased. That is the baseline of our standing before God, those words, that you, with Jesus, are a beloved child. That's where we begin our understanding of who we are. It doesn't mean we don't have areas in our life where we struggle, where the image of God in us might be distorted and we feel less than we could be. It simply means that sin and struggle do not define us. That isn't who we are. Who we are, our baseline understanding of who we are, is beloved child of God. Because those words spoken over Jesus are also for us. That's another part, a big part of the reason for Jesus' baptism, his identification with us, but also our identification with him as beloved children of God. Again, of course, it was Jesus' baptism, and it was special because it was Jesus. But he didn't need to do this. He didn't have to do this. He did it to stand in for us and with us, for humanity. Therefore, hear this. We are God's daughters, we are God's sons, and therefore we are brothers and sisters with Christ. So take it on faith. These words are for you too. You are God's son whom he loves. You are God's daughter whom he loves. With you, God is well pleased. Take it on faith. This is so important, and I can't emphasize it enough. We can't start a spiritual journey on a negative foundation. If we just seek God out of shame or guilt or fear, which is often the legacy of what we've called original sin, we won't get very far. If we start negative, we stay neg- We tend to stay negative. We have to begin positive by a wonderful experience, by something that's larger than life, by something that dips us into the depths of God's love and of our own being. That's what the word baptism actually means. It literally means to be dipped into. So we must begin as beloved, or begin again as beloved. If we begin with, you know, I'm a wretch, I'm a sinner, you know, then even the words of affirmation and identity can fall on deaf ears because the negativity of guilt or of shame or of God's apparent anger or displeasure with us, if that's all so difficult to get past. This is why we revisit this passage every year at this time, and it's part of the annual, what we call the lectionary, the cycle of the lectionary readings, in order to begin, or begin again, as beloved in the new year, to be dipped into the depths of love and life as we move into the new year. Jesus was dipped into this mystery of life and love, and that's where it all begins, even for him. The unique Son of God had to hear it with his own ears, And then, he couldn't be stopped. Then he had plenty to say and do for the next three years because he found his own identity and his own life's purpose. So we begin as beloved. Please take a few moments each day this week and rehearse this truth. I am God's daughter. I am God's son. God's beloved. With me, God is well pleased. I know this is so hard to believe. It takes work to believe it. We work hard at being good, at being better, at being self-made, at being something. But I firmly believe that we and all people need to work just as hard at being beloved. The rest will then take care of itself. If we can begin and begin again on a positive foundation, positive results will follow. Now, getting back to our account from Mark for a moment, it's critical for us to notice that Jesus had not done one thing before he heard these words, except consent to baptism. He hadn't taught, he hadn't healed anyone, he hadn't called any disciples yet to follow him. So this affirmation of Jesus came simply because it pleased God, his Father, to say it. And because it's the truth. Jesus' identity was not derived from what he did. He didn't receive it because the Father said, good job after feeding the 5,000. You are my beloved because you did such a good job. You've earned it. No, Jesus' identity came because the Father loved him. Period. That's it. 
Then he went and did stuff, a lot of good stuff. But his doing good flowed out of that relationship, and not because of the needs around him or out of duty or guilt or wanting to earn God the Father's approval. And it's the same with you and me. God our Father loves us, not if we perform so many good deeds or when we've earned it or because we do something. We are just his children, and it gives our Father pleasure to say it to us and to mean it. That's the beauty of child baptism. Words of blessing and covenant love are pronounced over that child before they're able to do anything or even respond in faith. That's where they receive their identity. And it's our job as parents and as fellow adult pilgrims in Christ's church to remind children as they grow of who they are. They are God's beloved kids. And to say that to them, you were baptized. Here is what God has said about you. You are God's beloved son, God's beloved daughter. With you, he is well pleased. Now, sometimes as a parent, in certain moments, we may not be well pleased with them. (laughs) But we tell them, I'm going to stick with what God says about you and act on that. So, God's love and identity are pronounced over Jesus before he did anything. And it's pronounced over us before we do anything. So... The first and most important question you and I can ask in prayer is not, what do you want me to do, but who am I in your sight? Ask that question first, and then be quiet, and let God speak words of affirmation and identity over you, the way they were spoken over Jesus. And then we will, we will be guided into the right actions. Our uh, Maplewood Church is one parish, one prisoner, or OPOP for short, <laughs> team is meeting this week uh, with our friend Dan Anderson and with Chris Hoke, um, who is the director of OPOP and of Underground Ministries. And the anticipation of that meeting got me thinking about this issue of belovedness and brokenness and what leads people to do the things they do when they hurt others and hurt themselves. And I'm convinced that most, if not all, who are in our prison system or have been in gangs have never heard these words of belovedness spoken over them by a parent figure. And they act out of their hurt and they act out of their pain rather than live a life from a place of belovedness. So I reached out to Chris Hoke this week and asked him about this, and I'd like to share his reply. He says, almost all of our OPOP members in prison are discovering this, that they are unconditionally loved by God, before even the release process begins, that people who have no obligation to them and before they have performed well or not once out of prison are writing letters to them, sending Christmas cards, and developing friendships. He said, just over Christmas, one man I've known in the Skagit Valley for years called me from prison. He applied for one parish, one prisoner, without fully understanding what he was getting himself into. But he called to say his team had just had a kickoff orientation and the new people were actually writing him letters. This tripped him out. He called me to rave tearfully about how wild that was. That, you know, these people like actually care about me. Why? My own family doesn't write me letters. I believe he was experiencing, this is Chris saying, I believe he was experiencing people seeing him, delighting in him. And through them, he experienced God's loving him unconditionally. And he says a young former MS-13 gang member did OPOP as well, and his team had grown to love him. They visited him in prison. They knew his story. They had built trust with his nine-year-old son in the community who now played with their kids. They prayed as a church and organized and fundraised and wrote letters. He was released by the judge last fall and has a future now in this community because his community delighted in him claimed him as their own, and as wanted. This is the experience of becoming beloved, Chris says. It's transformed his entire life and future. It makes me so glad, not only to proclaim to you that you are beloved, but to know that you are communicating this in tangible ways to those who need to hear it in your daily interactions throughout the week. And we are doing this together through our ministries and through our giving. Let me leave you with this great passage from the Apostle Paul in Galatians, who says, For in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. 
As many of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And there is no longer Jew nor Greek. There is no longer slave nor free. Think prisoner nor free. There is no longer male nor female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. And we're going to sing that passage right now in a hymn that might be new to some of you, but I think the tune uh, is singable, so let's give it a whirl. All right, Ian, take it away. seated. And I'll invite you to join me in prayer, uh, followed by the Lord's Prayer. And as we often do, there will be space for us to pray silently or out loud uh, for those in need um, who are on our hearts and minds this morning uh, by name. Let's pray. Creator God, when everything first began, water became a symbol of refreshing and renewing. Through the waters of creation, you brought forth abundant life. And we thank you for this symbol of renewal and refreshment and of recreation. We have gathered this day to remember Jesus' baptism, how you proclaimed that Jesus was your beloved child in whom you are well pleased. May our spirits resonate with that proclamation and be renewed in your love. As your beloved children at one with others who are also your beloved children, we lift up prayers to you for those in need, for those who grieve this day, and particularly the Suki family, for those in need of physical healing and emotional healing, for those who have difficult decisions to make in the days ahead, and for all the needs of those on our hearts. Hear us as we lift them to you now in the quietness of our hearts or out loud.
Loving God, as we have lifted before you these names of people near and dear to us who need your healing touch and your tender mercies, we also lift up our country and our world and those places and situations in need of your grace. In our world, there is ongoing war, particularly in Ukraine, and there are other forms of violence, oppression, and hunger. We're troubled by the reality that a six-year-old can wield a weapon and harm their teacher. Have mercy, O Lord. Heal your and our world. And as always, as each of us reaffirms our belovedness, may it lead us to being peacemakers and reconcilers. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn. Please gather, if you can, in the social hall for community building and support um, and enjoyment of refreshments as we continue our life together as God's people. And now go in peace, and as you go, may the grace of Christ attend you, the love of God surround you, and the Holy Spirit keep you, that you might live in faith, abound in hope, and grow in love now and forevermore. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.